Welcome to the Painter Marketing Mastermind Podcast, a show created to help painting company owners build a thriving painting business that does well over $1 million in annual revenue. I'm your host, Brandon Pierpont, founder of Painter Marketing Pros and creator of the popular PCA educational series, Learn, Do, Grow, Marketing for Painters. In each episode, I'll be sharing proven tips, strategies, and processes from leading experts in the industry on how they found success in their painting business. We will be interviewing owners of the most successful painting companies in North America and learning from their experiences. In this series, titled ZK's Words of Wisdom, Zach Kenny of ZK Painting will be discussing how he has overcome mistakes, best practices for serving high-end clientele, and social media marketing greatness. In this episode, episode one, Zach will be discussing the many failures and subsequent learnings and adaptations he has had to make on his journey to over $3 million per year in revenue. In episode two, Zach dives into how to best serve high-end customers given their somewhat unique needs and expectations. And in episode three, Zach will cover his keys to social media marketing greatness and how your painting company can begin implementing these tactics today. If you want to ask Zach questions related to anything in this podcast series, you can do so on our exclusive Painter Marketing Mastermind podcast forum on Facebook. Just search for Painter Marketing Mastermind podcast forum on Facebook and request to join the group or type in the URL facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Painter Marketing Mastermind. Again, that URL is facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash Painter Marketing Mastermind. There you can ask Zach questions directly by tagging him with your question so you can see how anything discussed here applies to your particular painting company. What's going on, Zach? Hey, how are you, Brandon? Good, man. I'm excited for this series with you. Got a lot to cover. Me too. So mistakes. Mistakes yeah, is man. a fun one. I've personally never made any. Fortunately, thank God. You know, I hear yeah, from nice. people made like a bunch. But yeah. I've made enough for both of us then. Yeah, no, I've made I've made many, many, many. Um but mistakes, I think it's great if you can ever hear someone else's mistakes and how it happened and, you know, what they did about it. And then you don't have to make the same mistake. That's always a blessing. Yeah, there's and there's just that saying about um, knowledge and wisdom or something and knowledge is learning, learning the hard way and wisdom is learning from others mistakes or something. There's some saying about that. Yeah, well, it definitely does seem wise to learn from other people's mistakes. But before we dive in to this, just give us some a breakdown of ZK painting, you know, where you're located, general size, how long you've been in business, who you serve, all that good stuff. Yeah. Um, so Zach Kenny from ZK painting, I started the company 12, 13 years ago, um, with a, a little giant ladder in a dream, a little different than, uh, uh paintbrush in a dream. It's in Paris, a little giant ladder, a couple paintbrushes, a thousand dollar, uh, Ford Taurus, um, but we're based in Boston. Um, we have a shop just outside of Boston and it's a town called Waltham, but we don't really do work there. Um, moved the company to Boston a couple of years ago. We have, uh, we run a mostly subcontractor model. We serve the ultra high end of the market. Um, we, um, sorry, someone called me and I, I have extreme ADD and I, I get distracted easy. We'll get through it, man. Uh, it's annoying laptop gets the phone calls too. Um, yeah, so we, we are, uh, a high end residential painting company. Um, I moved the company. I started in Rhode Island. Uh, I've been painting since I was 14 years old. Um, love the craft of painting and, uh, I've, I've definitely obsessed on the craft of painting for many, many years, I made a million mistakes. I thought, like many people, I think, uh, I wanted to get a raise and, uh, I thought the best way to get a raise was to start my own painting company. Uh, that was not probably the best way to do that. Um, but yeah, I, I was working as a painter. I never even became like a, a lead. I was just a painter. I was not a good employee. Um, but yeah, that's, that's sort of where we are now. We, we did a little over 3 million in revenue last year. Um, and it's just been a wild ride. Yeah. Well, that's great, man. I'm excited to get into the ride. So you serve the ultra high-end clientele. What does that mean exactly? I I mean, our people with where like, it's just like, it's a pretty crazy amount of money that people pay for paint jobs. Um, Because I think people say the high end of the market 
And like, I think the standards are so low in our industry that even when you're in the high end of the market, you're just like kind of playing for professionalism and like a decent paint job. Um, we are working with, uh, we sign a lot of NDAs. We work for billionaires and, and, and really high net worth individuals. Oftentimes, sometimes not sometimes people that just really value craftsmanship, but where the, like the paint job, I mean, is a, is a good example. Our average front door is like $8,000 to paint the front door. Right. That's not a thing I'll ever probably be able to afford. Um, it's definitely not a, um, I wouldn't call that high end. I, I think there's something past that where, you know, we're getting paid to to do something at a really high level, but also the uh, deliver an experience that matches the level of paint job that we offer. So I assume if a front door costs eight thousand dollars, I mean, you're probably doing projects routinely that are in six figures. Yes, very, very common. I, if you took out the doors from our projects, I think our average job size is is probably close to six figures. Wow. Would you recommend that market kind of before we get into your journey and how you got there? Is it a good market? I, I mean, I wouldn't recommend it. No, I would say um, I'm a big believer in like harnessing your biology and like following like how, how, what, how you're wired and what makes you tick. And like, for me, I'm a bougie dude and I like nice stuff and I'm like, I love all this stuff. I love thinking like my clients, thinking for my clients. Um, I really love extreme craftsmanship. Um, and I I like newness and chaos and, you know, custom problem solving. Um, I'm not, I mean, Jason Paris and I have different brains. Like, I, I think he's got this an amazing brain for like systems and processes. And I mean... I don't know. I don't want to speak for him, but like, I don't know if he cares about a paint job. Okay. Yeah, I'll speak for him. I don't <laughs> know if he like cares about a paint job, the level of finish on a paint job nearly the way I do. I'm, I'm, I just, I love human craft and what we're able to do. If you were to give us budgets to put human craftsmanship into like, they are, my clients are like patrons to the arts back in the day. Right. And, um, if you're not wired like me, I don't know that my my part of the in industry is for you. Um, it's a very uh, stressful. I don't think it's like extra lucrative by any means. Um, I think that people with a lot of money are very smart about how they spend it. I think if you're going to spend six figures on a paint job, you're going to be pretty intentional and pretty, you know, you're not going to be an easy client necessarily. So like large ticket items, um, they're also like, we don't get a lot of at bats, right? If we bid something wrong, it can go real wrong. We don't get a lot of iteration the way if your average job size is $5,000, you can figure out you're doing something wrong pretty quick and you can iterate and get out of there pretty quick. So I, I, it's not like it's a market, I would say it's not for the profit, it's for profitability sake and like sleeping at night and scalability, it's not the most attractive market. Um, if you want to be like, I did that, it's fucking cool. Yeah. It's a pretty good market for that. Um, yeah. and I think I've had to really change. I'm working to change a lot of the dynamics of my market to try to turn it into a profitable business. Um, so what is your typical gross profit margin on your projects? Uh, we try to be between 40 and 50%. Okay. So fairly um, strong. we try to be, um, we're again, we, be, with the few number of jobs and large job size, you don't get a lot, you don't get to iterate very quickly and learn from your mistakes very fast. Um, you know, you might lock in a, the sales cycle is pretty long in what we do. So, you know, it's like, it's everything takes a long time to figure out if it's working or if it's not working and theory to actual practice can be a long, you know, you're not getting that fast iterating. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Okay. So I, I want to, I don't want to go too far down this path because I know in the next episode we'll be talking about serving the high end clientele, but I, I do have one question. I just want to make sure we ask you're using subcontractor model, which to me would, 
immediately kind of raise concerns. You know, people are concerned about quality control and stuff. Obviously, the level you're playing at, the quality control is the highest that it could really possibly be. How do you handle that? It's really, it's hard. I, I would say well, the main thing is, is uh, having big budgets, right? It's selling projects for what it really costs to do the work. Um, so it starts in the sales process. It starts, the sales process also is a very, a lot of what we do is, is set expectation. So we're going to do a lot of control samples, a lot of um, setting expectations so that everybody kind of understands. Um, and then, and we, a lot of what we do is sell process, right? Um, not everyone loves that. And some clients give us pushback about that, uh, especially on, a new construction, which we don't do much of, it's fairly standard, but like on a restoration project, I can't really, it's, it's not very practical to sell outcome as much as it is process. Like how many times are we going to do a certain thing? I can estimate and sell that. If you say, I want my trim to look perfect, that's a different thing. And that's really hard to, to quantify and to bill for. So if we had, if we ever do have clients like that, which are very rare, you know, you need to do something that's like a time and material basis type of project. If, if, if the end result is what everyone's so hyper-focused on. Um, yeah, I kind of lost my train. Of really thought. interesting. That's kind of the, um, the opposite of how we operate, you know, as a marketer, you, you wouldn't, you wouldn't want to sell on deliverables. You'd want to sell on results, but you're saying essentially because you can't always control these results you know 100 percent, especially with the restoration and things like that you're basically gonna sell and you're gonna do world class in terms of your deliverables you're gonna you know i guess put in into play the the best possible scenario to get the best possible result but you can't guarantee exactly what it will look like at the end because some of that is outside of your control yeah and because there's budgets there is still i don't, I don't care if i'm working with a billionaire they still have a budget. Like people with money are smart about how they spend their money. So if we're on a three or four or $500,000 paint job, like it doesn't mean that there's not constraints on us. Yep. Um, there, there are, and oftentimes there's a lot of constraints and a lot of eyes and a lot of schedule and a lot of, a lot of things that like, yeah, it, it can be difficult when people are like, well, I want an outcome. Um, that just means like, cause paint's subjective. You know, when you look at a paint job, it's like wine. It, it tastes different in different situations. And so it, it makes it tough when you have a, when you're trying to deliver a subjective product. That makes sense, man. And yeah, people do have that misconception that extremely wealthy people, they just throw their money around when it's actually typically is the opposite. They got to where they got by not just doing that. You know? Yeah. And, and also there's a phenomenon that I've noticed, like, so let's just say, let's pick a made up number, but like $100 a square foot is, uh, you you charge $100 a square foot to paint one room, right? And the room is 100 square feet. So it's ten yeah, it's $10,000. That's right, math, I think. So that like clients, I found like clients will pay $10,000 to paint a room. But now if you take that $100 a square foot and you multiply it over a 10,000 square foot house, right? Now you're in a million dollars, right? I think so. So like that million dollar ticket is a way harder thing to digest, but you could have painted a bunch of $10,000 rooms to get there in a way like large numbers make people think of things differently. And I think that we often struggle with that where clients, as we get to the larger numbers, um, be, the, the magnifying glass comes out even more. Sure. I mean, at some point they might be assuming, you know, economies of scales or, or like a discount or, you know, however, but let's get into some of these mistakes. Yeah, so man. Made a lot of mistakes. I'm the king of mistakes. King of mistakes. I don't know if you, if you want to do it chronologically, I don't know if you, you want to do it in like the, the worst to the least mistake. However, you want to walk through this. I think for my brain, it's probably going to be easier if we just do it chronologically. Okay. Um, and I, I, I didn't sit here and like do a bunch of homework and have a bunch of bullet points, but like, uh, I think if we just start at the beginning, um, there's quite a few, uh, there, there's just so many, I will never be able to think of all of them, but I can highlight the ones I have a very poor memory as well. But, um, I think so we they can... stuck in your brain. They were 
they were probably yeah, they're still if i can still remember them from 12 years ago it hurt they're bad. yeah um, <laughs> it hurt and i mean I, we can start with let's there's start with a lot of them i got yeah i think failure let's just start with like overall i think failure is incredible it's 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 uh it's a very valuable tool right i was watching billions the other day one of my favorite shows and like that saying came up of uh, failure is not a destination right and and i you know sayings until you get them in context, you're feeling something that they, sometimes they just go in one ear, out the other. But if you're in the right mood, the right context, your more emotional state, a saying can really like connect. And I think that that saying, it really connected me at the, at the time the other day when I saw it. And it really is like failure is not a destination. Failure is, it's a data point that gives you, uh, it, it points you in a direction. Even if that direction is don't go this way. That's better than no direction. And in life, as I try to navigate business and you're going through this woods that's infinite and can go in all directions, you start a business, you can do anything you want. We're in America. Like it's infinite. Yeah. Like you, those, those um, data points to say like, Hey, don't go here can be super valuable. It's, it's like playing battleship. Like as you're in the dark and you start to see the world more, those, those no's are just can be just as valuable. Um, so I think, and I don't know that we exactly grow up in a in a society and education where failure is looked at that way. I think in standardized testing and all these things of like, I'm gonna tell you exactly what's on the test, and like now how close to perfect can you get? It's not a great um proxy for life. And I think I've had to learn through reading books and talking to entrepreneurs and just being a dude who just didn't have like had desperation on his side. Uh, I learned that mistakes are something that like are really valuable. And if you're not making mistakes, you're probably not stretching yourself very much and, and I'm staying safe. And so learning to hedge your, your bets, right. Don't put them all, don't go all in on one thing. Cause if the, if you make a mistake there, it can, you know, I think the secret to business is don't go out of business. I think someone else way smarter than me has said that, but like, Stay along, stay around long enough. I, I think I did not understand when I first started how powerful momentum in business is. And when you're 10 years in business, man, life is so much easier than when you're starting out. When you start out and that merry-go-round on the playground has is stopped, you got to push really hard in only one direction to get that thing to spin. But once it's spinning fast, like, good luck. Don't touch it. Like, yeah. there's a lot, of, like, that momentum thing, I, I wish I would have understood more. So, yeah, back to the failures. Like, I now try to embrace the failures. I try to make calculated risks, understand if it fails, what will happen, right? You know, don't just blindly take risks that without being calculated about it. But, like, hey, knowing, oh, this is, like, this is could fail. Like, and that's okay. Cause if it fails, it's going to give me information. Um, so I, I mean, but talking about failures that I, I, I guess I learned something from every failure, but uh, famously I painted the wrong house, uh, a long time ago <laughs> before I was working for myself, I, I painted the wrong house. Um, that's like the first, one of the first big ones. Yeah. It's pretty embarrassing. One the, it's one of the biggest ones I've ever heard. That's, that's pretty wild, man. <laughs> It's pretty wild. It was a rental property. So the tenants, they didn't know any better. They didn't know their house wasn't supposed to be getting painted. It was a three-day trim only job on one of the ugliest homes known to mankind. Um, it was like asphalt shingles that like, it was like shaped like a square. And the asphalt shingles came straight down the house, like to almost like shoulder, like shoulder height <laughs> around the whole house. And then they just had like cutouts for windows. So it was, and then it had a soffit underneath that, that kind of went under and then down to the house. It was one of the ugliest houses you've ever seen. And this was back in MapQuest days. And uh, my dad had showed me a picture of the house and gave me a set of MapQuest directions. And so we were driving to the house one morning, me and one one of my guys, one of my brother, I might have been my brother. Um, me and some guy were in the work van driving to this house. And you get down to like the last MapQuest direction and like, you kind of, there's the ugliest house in the world. Like I could never miss it. How could there be two? 
<laughs> there was two. So we got set up. We scraped. We primed. We painted the trim over two or three days. Um, and then like a week or two later, my dad was like, clients, like, why didn't you paint the house yet? I'm like, dad, we painted that house. And I'll never forget on 4th of July, we uh, we made a trip down there so I could prove to him that I had painted this house. And sure enough, we drove by the house that I had painted to get to the second ugliest house in the world. And it had not been painted. Man, that is, yeah, that's a story. So what did you, I guess, what did you learn from that? What did you walk away from? Um, I mean, I learned on my like really you that I, at that time I was far too young to learn from mistakes I I mean I was so full of myself I was a terrible employee um my dad should have learned to be more thorough in his management of his employees <laughs> I think, that's for sure he my dad was a terrible business terrible paint he owned a paint company for a couple of years it, it was not successful at all uh, but I learned everything not to do from him right all his failures I guess were a big teaching for me um, I think most importantly from that, that experience, it's hard to really say, I don't, that's more of a funny one, but, yeah. um, I learned from my dad and my dad was passionate like me about quality and, uh, he had no idea how to price things. So I think I was very hypersensitive to underpricing myself from the beginning. Um, I watched my dad just massively over deliver on projects and lose his shirt. But if, and he didn't do job costing or bookkeeping, Nick Slavic. Um, and so he just had stacks of receipts and, and, and like I did for many years, like he managed his painting business by like, is there money in the bank right now? Like, that's my metric on, um, am I doing well or not? Yeah. Uh, you know, and that is, if anyone is wondering, that's not the way to do it. Like job costing is the answer. If you don't know, if you're not making money on the job, don't go to work. Like learn the jobs you don't make money on and stop doing them. I wish that took me a decade to learn. Um, it was not a coincidence. I was broke for a decade um, because I didn't ever look back. I think I was too afraid. I was too afraid to look back at the numbers and see if I made any money. Because I think I would have had to face this brutal truth that I didn't. And I was very idealistic. I think craftsmen are very can be very idealistic about painting. I know how to do a level of craft. So I'm going to do it. But what right. if the client only paid for half that level? So I think, and Nick is very eloquent about all this and, and talks about how like, okay, the client pays for this level. Let's deliver here and we win. Anything past that, you're an asshole. Like right. you just are. Like, what are we doing? We're not martyrs. We're not nonprofits. There are people who deserve our charity far more than people who can aff afford a paint job. Yep. Um, I, I wish I would have learned to separate my ego away from the craft. Like my ego, I, I was very so, uh, self-conscious about being a painter. Um, and so if I was going to be a painter, I was going to be a high end, high quality painter. And, and I think I did all of that in spite of like in flying in the face of my best interests in, in making any money at all. Um, even making clients happy. I've massively over delivered on projects, but made it a very difficult experience for the client. And they didn't want that. They just wanted to, their walls trim painted and like, get out of my house. Exactly. Please leave. I'm not done. Are you kidding me? I can make it 10 times better. <laughs> like, yeah. Um, I wish I would have just started doing job costing sooner. Um, I think another mistake I made was, uh, I don't think it's a bad thing to over deliver early on in business to like get to another level of clientele. I don't think that's bad at all. Um, I did it many times. I've, I've given discounts or whatever over, over delivered on scope to either practice myself, to have a body of work that says I can do this. Those are all great. Uh, but what I, what I didn't understand and what I wish I, what the mistakes I made during that and what I tell people now is like, if you're going to over deliver, do it at the end of the project, don't go do something for free early on in the project. That's one of the worst things you can do. You you paint an extra door for a client on the first day of a project. Watch that project blow up because people don't want to be indebted to somebody else. Yeah. When you when you paint a door for them and don't charge them for it and don't ask, they feel indebted on day one. No one wants. Think about we all have those friends who manipulate us by 
maybe you know, Hopefully you don't have these friends, but we all know people who will do stuff for you as a way to then have leverage over you later. And it's like, I didn't ask you to go out of your way and do these things. So I think doing um, free or extra stuff early in a project is very dangerous. If the client is great and the project goes well and you want to paint their mailbox at the end. Awesome. And and it's 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 a win-win and everyone's happy. But I think oftentimes I was doing that extra thing for clients as a way to have to buy some leeway later on to, to have a little bit of buffer and be able to make mistakes and be able to show up late to a job one day and feel like, yeah, well, I painted their door for free. So like I can do this. Yeah. Um, I think it was very selfish giving. I think it's very dangerous. Um, and you were finding rather than getting more grace from the client, if anything, they were kind of turning around and, and being a, a little bit harder to deal with. Oh, absolutely. It's, a, it's, I think anyone who's ever done it can, can attest that like the result you think you're going to get is the opposite of what you get. And it, when you really break down the human psychology of it, it kind of makes sense. I like, nobody wants to be forced into owing somebody something. Yeah. And I don't care what you say. If you do something for free for somebody, they're going to feel a sense of debt indebtedness to you. And how would that come out? Would that come out as just, yeah. I mean, just being, I guess, more um, detail oriented or having more of an issue with some of the work that you did or how would that manifest? I think there's, it's, it actually loses trust, right? I think pricing in our industry is, is already a, a low trust situation where people are like, did you just pick, pick these numbers out of the sky? And like, if I can move my price, if I, if you clients like, look, I really want to hire you, but if you can take a thousand dollars off, like the job's yours. And if you could just take a thousand dollars off, like, was the price just like made up out of the sky? Yeah. Right. Like, maybe they would have taken $1,500 off if I asked them. Maybe it would have been 2000 And this, like, this inner dialogue of like, am, is this pricing even real? Am I, or am I just getting taken advantage of? I think that starts to creep in where, like, if you go, I know my numbers, here are my numbers, here's the price. And if you want $1,000 off, you got to give me something flexibility of schedule. Um, ability to market the job, whatever. Like, even if I've made shit up, I've pretended like something was a credit. I just needed the job, but I would never take money off a job for no reason. That I think makes the client feel like they're paying for a thing that didn't, maybe wasn't the best price. So if you needed the job and you could do the job whenever, and someone approached you with that, Hey, I really want to give it to you. Take a thousand dollars off. You would advise the painting company owner estimator to basically make something up potentially like, well, Hey, you know what? We, we can do that. We actually have a really tight week for the next two weeks. If you can hold off and we can start on this date, then I can do that for you. Cause that'll fit in really well with their schedule. Yeah. Or can I market this? Can I have, can I make videos? Can like now maybe I'll feel cool, but can I make videos about the project while we do it? Yeah. Like I was probably going to do that anyway, but now they feel like, they're giving up something to get that discount. Mm -hmm. And now they're, okay, the price came from someplace. But I think a lot of clients have a hard time believing that pricing is real with painters. Because I think a lot of us just are making shit up. I mean, I did most, I still do. I'm most of, <laughs> like, you know, what I do is hard to really quantify because it's so custom yeah. that a lot of it is kind of like portfolio estimating. Like, all right, you win some, you lose some. Cause I don't know, I can't possibly know all the things on a $400,000 paint job, how everything's going to go. Right. The way you can on a $5,000 basic exterior repaint. True. Um, you know, my linear foot and my square foot pricing, if I look back on projects, it can vary so much based off of so many design details, scheduling, GCs, uh, parking. High, if you're worked in high rises, like it adds so much to cost. There's so many things, right? But I think, Generally, clients have a hard time believing price, especially if you if you if all of your prices end in zero zero zero, like two thousand, three thousand, four thousand. Like, <laughs> I'm sorry, but nobody believes your prices are accurate. If you're like, I think it's important, even if they're not, to start putting in some weird numbers. So people are like, oh, like cents. Would you get to that? I've level? never done cents. That that seems exorbitant to me. <laughs> thirty seven cents. If you go thirty seven cents. Good on you. Um, yeah. But I, if I'm charging, you know, 
thirty thousand plus, and I'm getting into cents. That's- <laughs> <laughs> that starts to seem unrealistic from the other other it's side. The other side, right? It's like, what is this fucking guy doing? <laughs> um, but I think that there really is a lot to be said for the trust in the sales process and how do we build it. And and so I wish I. And so back to my thing, like if I'm going to upgrade a paint job, I want to make sure I get two caveats and I get them in writing. I've learned this the hard way. I'm going to have a, a flexible schedule, right? I'm going to have more time. Okay. I'm, I'm doing a, my first gloss door. I need to have an unlimited amount of time. I've never done this, Miss Jones. How could I tell you how long it's going to be? And I'm probably going to fail at it three times. I need time, right? And I need, but people will say, yeah, 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 yeah. When you tell them they're going to get something for free. Sure. You got to get it in writing. I had a client who told me I could document an entire project. And then at the end, um, acted like we had never talked. It was so bizarre. And I could have gone to court and done all these things. But instead, I just had to move on and learn my lesson. Um, And then the second one is I need to be able to document this. I need to be able to take photos and videos. I need to have clients be able to come over and see this. If I'm selling my next job, I can't tell you how many big projects we sell by taking clients on tours of our old projects. That's a very valuable thing. Well, if I have a client who wants privacy and wants me to sign an NDA, which we're on a big project right now, we had just everybody sign NDAs. All right, well, they're definitely not getting a pricing discount because I can't even tell the world that I'm doing this really cool shit that I'm going to do for the next year. Yeah. You know, I I think it's it's understanding like if I'm going to give something, I'm going to get something um, in return. The client's going to give something up. It's an interesting, uh, it's not something you really hear typically taking a potential client and walking them through a previous project. That's definitely an ultra high end thing. Yeah. That's a thing. If you're about to pull the trigger on a $400,000 paint, the, the last one we did was like $450,000 paint job. And so I you would like, not recommend five, you know, the, the middle market that they just you're selling $5,000 paint jobs. I that's people don't, I don't think they care. <laughs> no yeah. one's gonna like take a day out of their their especially my clients are taking a day out of their Saturday to go look at a project. Like, you know, it, because they're making big decisions. And yeah, no, for sure. One thing you said during all that, which was really interesting, is that you had desperation on your side when you were starting and for a long time. I think desperation is a powerful tool too. But can you talk more about that? Yeah. I mean. I don't come from like a family that was going to have like a safety net of any type financially. Um, That was very clear. Um, So it was like, I think I I just didn't have a safety net and I didn't have anything. And like when I moved home and like started working by the hour, I mean, when I started my business, when I was working for $15 an hour with a little giant ladder and a Ford Taurus painting a flip house, like I just, I didn't have, I could not eat. Like I couldn't put gas in my car, like if I didn't work. And I think that that level of desperation and I, I kind of had that for a very long time, close to a decade, I think, and now maybe, maybe eight years of, of just like living check to check, pawning tools to make payroll, um, payroll. Yeah. To, to pay people cash at the end of the week. That's what I did for the first eight years. Another huge mistake. Uh, if we want to talk about mistakes, if you want to build a real business uh, and have great employees, I, I'll tell you right now, great employees don't work for cash. They just don't. People who, great employees are steady and they want steadiness and and safety in their lives. And people who work for cash aren't those people. Yeah. And I, I think I waited way too long to get on a payroll service because I knew once I got on a payroll service, now I'm, I have to have... The, all that money in the bank, I got to pay all those taxes, all that workman's comp. I got all that money is coming out on top of what I'm paying this person, right? And I have to have that money. I can't wait a day. You know, the number of times I'll I'll get I'll pay you on Saturday or I'll pay you next Monday. Cash gave me flexibility, and I paid guys cash for way 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 too long. Because and it, what it meant was I I was stuck with subpar employees. So that's definitely a huge mistake I made. Uh, but the days were, go ahead how would you try to fix that so if you're if you're feeling like you are worried about making payroll you know or or you know what would be payroll right but in cash and you think you probably have a team of subpar employees you are kind of in a chicken and the egg scenario you go backwards you got to go back to being just you working 
And until you can get a charge rate that's high enough and a business that's high, because honestly, you can make great money painting by yourself. That's if you can't make great money painting by yourself, stop painting and go work for somebody. Mm. Because if you're like when you're doing all the things and you only have to keep one guy busy this year, like time is on your side. You can raise your prices. You can hear no a lot. You don't have to sell many jobs. And then you're super efficient. So if you can't, as a painter, owner, operator, if you cannot like make good money as a single painter, don't hire employees. Employees reduce efficiency, right? You're, I think that I just did not know that. Another huge mistake. I grew way too fast. I hired way too many people. Um, I think it's this, this, the concept of like a minimum viable product or like, what is the, at what point can this thing sustain by itself before I can scale it? It needs to be a net positive entity. Yeah. (laughs) And like, I just didn't understand that. I was chasing, like I had more revenue. I had more jobs to do. I don't want to do all this work. So I'll just put more people. And if I have people working, I'm obviously making money. Like, what do you mean? Of course. Um, And man, that's a miserable, miserable existence. Like slow down to go fast. Like you gotta, it's gotta work. Just one me and me and one guy. So if it's just, if it's just you, you know, you're saying you should be able to make good money. And so one thing I try to do on the podcast is always try to nail down specific. So if people listen, what if they're like, oh, you know, I'm making like 40 grand. I think maybe it's time to hire someone. What would you define as good money? Well, let's, let's say this, making the money that you want to make. So let's say I, I estimate a job to take 10 hours. Okay. What's my hourly rate? I'm multiplying by the 10 hours. Well, people I used to think I was getting paid $18 an hour. So if I make 25, I'm killing it. And that's not true. Go to a PCA event, talk to anybody. You'll find out like, I would say if, you know, 45, $50 an hour, you want to be able to charge 45, $50 an hour. That's going to cover all of your things. Right. So now, okay. You do the job in 10 hours. That's $500 to do the job plus materials. Okay. Now do you do the job in 10 hours? Do you make that $50 an hour that you estimated? If every time you estimate, oh, I asked my sir, hourly rate, $50 an hour. But do you go double the hours on every job you estimate? Well, then no, you're actually earning $25 an hour. Right. And so I think it's like different costs of livings mean different things. Everybody has different expe- expectations. So making good money is probably not a good way to say it. It should be more of like, are you doing what you want to do? And are you turning a profit? Like if you're going to pay an employee you know, $20 an hour, then you're going to pay all the things on top of it. You need to be charging $45 an hour for that person. Are you making $45 an hour? Is that, is that what you're actually producing? And if you're not, then you need to figure out how to get it so that you are before you start adding people to this equation. Because as you add people to the equation, it becomes harder and harder to make profit, to be efficient. Your efficiency goes down while you're trying to increase efficiency. So if, if you're looking to hire, you should you should know that your hourly rate covers somebody, that you still make money. There should probably be a little bit of margin for error, that that employee is probably not going to be as good as you are. You know, they're not going to care as much as you do. And then you should probably have quite a few leads that you either weren't able to get to or that told you no, but you think you could have probably gotten them to say yes, or you know that there you have X, Y, or Z marketing channel you could tap into to get more leads because when you pull yourself out, now all of a sudden, what are you going to be doing? If you're not if you're not generating more projects with the increased workforce, then you're basically just maybe working less, but you're also making a lot less money now because you're paying for someone else. So I you think it's visual, visualize removing yourself from that role. And I wouldn't stop painting before. until you have four guys painting for you, right? I think that's generally where you want to be, yeah. right? I, I, to to not paint and have one painter that works for you too fast. That is like, I mean, the numbers to make that work are wild and they're not practical. And like, that's crazy, right? Yeah. So So you put four as, as the minute until you have four, you should, I would say four, you know, and, and I think everyone has their own tolerances for what do they want to make themselves? 
what is their market bear today? Like what can they command dollar wise, price wise? Um, mm -hmm. But it's, I love this basic economics equation of supply and demand. And it's this the most tried and true thing of all time, supply and demand. If demand increases and supply stays the same, price increases. Yep. It's the simplest thing. Don't hire any more people. Stay you and a guy. All right, we'll build demand. Get more people to want to hire you. And don't hire any new people. Well, you can start to raise your rates. Yep. I think it's when we first start painting companies, at least my experience, when I needed every job I bid to eat, I had to win that job. That is a horrible, horrible position to be in. It's the absolute lack of leverage. I, I've i done everything in my power today to, I look at every single job and I just do not need it. I'm apathetic. I'd like to, I'd like to win this job, but on my terms, right? It's like dating. Like I'd like to have a partner, but on my terms, like, yeah, I'm sure you could have a partner no matter what, if you just completely changed who you were. And, but like, that's not the answer. The answer is like, hear no and get used to hearing no. And as long as you have enough work to keep working and you're hearing no, like if you're not ever hearing no, you're not charging nearly enough, right? Everybody knows. I mean, that's a, that's a very common thing, right? But it was really hard for me to hear no. I'm a people pleaser. I want everyone to like me all the time. So I think- Getting used to no is is huge. So the best way to do that is to stay small. Because what I hear all the time is people go, oh, I'm so busy. I'm so busy. All right, well, start raising your prices, man. Start hearing no. Like, it's very, very simple. But I think a lot of times when I first start, when you first start a painting company, you have only have the worst, the worst clients. The worst clients are the ones who hire new painting companies, right? <laughs> you just do. Yeah, it makes sense. My clients would, the, my best clients and all my clients, but my best clients, they would never hire a new painting company, right? Yep. All the best clients are already being served by a painter today. When you start your painting company, assume that all the best clients are already being served that day. Now, tomorrow, somebody might move to your town and not have a painter already. Okay. There's a good excuse for why they might, a great client might call you. But like, for the most part, I think when you first start out, I couldn't believe someone was going to pay me to paint something. But really, you have to look at like, why is this person going to pay me, Joe Blow, with no reviews on Google and no experience? At the bar? Like, why are they going to? No, they're trying to take advantage of me. So oftentimes we start those early data points color our view of business. Oh, I have clients will never pay X or clients are like this or clients are like that. Yeah, all the worst clients are like that. And in early business, I was getting all the worst clients and I was making these, I was starting to develop a, a, a framework for the world that was really fucked up because it was based off of all these bad clients and bad feedback. So I think getting to that position where you can say no, like I know guys, guys have come to my school who is one man operation. He's $120 an hour in his first or second year in business because he started doing side work first, built up his side work. And with side work, you have a full-time job. Like, I don't want to come work on my weekends and not make good money. Yeah. So you can say no. I'm like, no, here's my price. But if you want me, I'm here, call me. And that that mindset of like, when you're small, it's like, here's what I'm worth. Here's what I want to make. Take it or leave it. Now, if you have no options, you're screwed, right? That's the demand side. We need to increase the demand side. But- you go hang out at the paint store, talk to GCs. There's so many ways to build demand. If you're a one-man painter, that's when you got to get your hourly rate up. The only way to raise your hourly rate is when you're small. Once you have a huge team of people you have to keep busy, that's way harder to raise your rates. Yeah. You can't be quite as picky at that point. Yeah. That's a really interesting concept. I don't, I don't think I've ever heard anyone talk about that. And I, <clears throat> I think it applies to a lot of businesses, but you know, we're talking about painting here. I think the idea that when you're starting out, why would someone take a risk, so to speak, on you? And you know, every purchase or every, every buying decision is really an exchange of value in some way. So the value that you might be lacking in terms of experience or portfolio or referrals, or Google reviews, you could potentially have in terms of them paying you less money. 
and kind of taking advantage of you. Maybe they'll try to get you to do additional work, expand your scope because they know that you were desperate for the job and you need the review. And, um, and that might be, again, it might be something that you have to do. It might not be ideal, but, but those exchange of value, Hey, I, I want to review. I'm willing to do this, but I want, we're going to do it together. You're going to leave me a review or a portfolio or whatever. Um, but, but recognizing that that is a certain segment of the population that you were serving, that is not everybody. That's where you are as a business and you're just in kind of a crappy spot, but you're there because you're starting and everyone starts there usually. Uh, and then not letting it taint a forever kind of put a glass ceiling upon what you can charge and what you can do with your company. I think that's amazing. Way too much. And, and, and contractors and the comments and like, they, like those early years will taint their whole view of the market. And it's like, no, man, you just had bad data. Yeah. Man, then that that's uh that's wild. It's like to Jason Phillips, the you know contractor prison. That's where you get kind of trapped there. Yeah, and you and and then it's a self fulfilling prophecy, man. Like, because then you start to have to you start playing you start playing because business is on some level business is listening to the market and giving it what it wants. Sure, definitely. I had to learn that the hard way for sure. You can't be idealistic and too idealistic in business, but also we need to be understanding of like what market are we listening to and what market are we trying to solve? And like, until I was a fine paints of Europe certified painter and I went to Vermont and I met these people who were working for billionaires and who had these crazy clients. And, you know, one guy only used fine paints of Europe. And I looked over and I was like, are you fucking kidding me? You have a business and you only use fine paints of Europe. How, like, My mind was exploded. It was a four minute mile. All of a sudden yeah. these guys are telling me they've run the four minute mile. Yeah. Do it too. And, but until I like was exposed to that stuff, I didn't know these people existed. And because they were already being served, all the best clients in your market are being served by a painter today. Why? I, I'm going to have to do some, my, if I have a great client, I'm going to do everything for them to make them never want to call another painter. So that's always like the thing. It's like why the great clients aren't calling new painters unless they move towns, their painter retires. Like there's a very few handful of reasons why a great client's going to call somebody to ask for a paint job. Yeah. Let's kind of, and, and it doesn't have to go all the way to your level, but for someone who's earlier on or they're listening and they're like, man, you know, I, I think I do have bad clients overall. I'm not really happy with, with who we work with generally. What would the process be to sort of move up market? How would you recommend they move up market? I think it's, it's, if you build it, they will come. Like there's definitely a level of that. Um, it is doing your best to put yourself in the shoes of somebody else, right? I think that was really hard for me. And I vividly, I tell this story a lot. I vividly remember the day where I was, what was happening when I had the epiphany of like, I am going to charge what I'm worth here and not what I think this person would pay or what I would pay and what all these bad clients have been paying. Like, I got my first opportunity to build, to bid this like $4 million beach house, sick house on the water, amazing clients. They called me at a time as a, through a referral. They called me when I was like drowning on another job. And I was like, Oh, I can't even get there to look at it. I was just like, I don't fucking talk to me. I was like, I can't even get there for two weeks to look at it. And I, so it already sort of like, I, I was like, ah, I'm overwhelmed. I can't, I went to the job. I noticed like, this is my wheelhouse. Like I was offering product systems and solutions for them that no one else was going to. And I like really love what I was doing. They loved me. I was still one of my best clients to this day. Uh, almost, I don't can't remember, maybe seven years later, eight years later. And my first client, and I, I remember I, I did the bid and then it, I'm making up numbers to spend so long, but it was, maybe it was like $28,000 to do a, a lot or $38,000 to do a lot of work. And I remember I put like, I want to 15 or $20,000. I just added to the bid at the end. And they said, yes. And it was the first time I probably ever made a dollar of painting. Alchemy. Yeah. And, and, but I just, I, I, somehow it all happened where I realized like, wait a second, this person has a $4 million house. They're not going to paint their house very often. I just brought every solution in the world to them. They're not going to make or break their decision off $15,000. Now, what I didn't know, 
like in hindsight, my pricing was laughably low that I added the $15,000 to, right? Because I was used to working for $15, $20 an hour. Yeah. That's where my pricing structure was coming from. So it, it worked that way too. But like when I started to understand like there are other people out there who think differently than I do or the people I grew up with do. And so start to think about, well, what are the businesses that serve those people and how do those businesses work? And, and some of it is just imagination and like putting yourself in the shoes of other people and like taking the constraints off of like what I would like, I don't, we don't say no to anything on like an extreme level. We never say no, but like, I talked to a lot of guys and, and I think a lot of people are like, well, no, that can't happen. And what they mean is that's so expensive. I've never had anybody that would, that's willing to pay that. That's what they really mean. Yeah. But they don't say that. They say, no, can't do that. They don't even allow themselves to like, think about what somebody else might do that had a little more money or maybe wanted, had more money, but also valued other things. Right. Maybe peace of mind is something they really value. And like, if you're the owner of the painting company and you're going to be there every single day, all day, maybe somebody would pay more for that. Certain people will pay more for that than they'll pay for my company where I'm not going to be there all day, every day. And I think the way to get to the next level is to A, have the opportunity to say no to stuff, start pushing your pricing and see where it goes. And then you have to, you have to deliver more. Like you have to, you can't just charge more. You have to deliver more. And oftentimes delivering more can just mean like answering the phone and submitting a, a proposal quickly yeah. or, you know, it just, it's, it's these like little things that when I was a painter, we were just like, go, 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 go all the time. And you, you never stop to think about what is this like for the client? Yeah. Um, that, that concept of delivering more. So, you know, for, for painter marketing pros, we're good at what we do. We deliver good marketing results. But one of the ways we deliver more is communication. And so it's something a lot of marketing agencies don't think about. They think about, well, the only, it's only results. It's the results. Doesn't matter how you communicate. Doesn't matter how you treat. Doesn't matter if you have a monthly call. It that doesn't, all they care about is the leads and the results. Well, actually they get a whole lot of value out of the communication, out of being available, right? It's one of the, th one of the most positive feedbacks we get about painting marketing pros. With a painting company, that communication, like you said, obviously the bare, like kind of ridiculous basics of answering, <laughs> answering your phone. That's absurd, right? It's absurd that, that, that you have to say that and that that's so common, but showing up on time, giving people you leverage automation. There's so many different automations that make it so easy. Leverage automation to let them know, Hey, remind them you're coming tomorrow or remind them, Hey, your estimates upcoming, make the journey easy for them. It's just, you put these few key pieces in place to make that customer journey so much easier for them so that they know exactly what's going on. And all of a sudden you you are delivering way more and you're delivering in a way more efficient way than if you think, oh my gosh, like, well, how do I make the paint, the paint project like be so much better magically? Or how do I, how do I like, oh, maybe I do like another code or maybe I add some extra. That's not what it means to deliver more. And that's where that transfer of value, you know, especially if you are an owner operator, if you're a single painter, for you, your whole focus, at least a large part of your focus is on the actual project, the actual technical, you know, fulfillment of what you're doing. But that's not the focus of the homeowner. So don't value exchange. It's not what they're buying. No. Let's be real. It's, it's not buying. what people are buying. Yeah. And it's just that as painters, we I was I was an employee and I was a painter. And all I thought about was painting all day. And then one day I started a painting company. Well, I didn't change my thinking. All I thought about was paint. That's all that's all they care about. They're just buying the paint on the wall. That's it. Are you kidding me? They they're buying the, the paint on the wall of the room the when it's a new color. Yeah. They're buying the peace of mind of what happens when you're in their house. Yep. They can change the color at some level. Like they're buying a bunch of other things and the paint job happens to be one of them maybe, but yeah. when you're a painter, it's hard to like not see through the lens of paint jobs. And so I think that, that if you want to go to the next level, you have to think like the people at the next level and it's, Un, almost undoubtedly it's going to be about customer experience and it's, it's not going to be about high, delivering a higher level paint job. Yeah. The, you know, there, there's all this stuff about mindset, right. And, and all that stuff. And, and some of it's kind of like hoopla, you know, kind of whatever, some of it's actually really good. 
Um, but for people who are listening to this and, and they're like, yeah, you know, I, I do probably think, or maybe I think, I don't even know if I think too much about the paint job. I'm listening to this, but it's possible. How do you fix it? Like, is it just, Hey, go in a room and just sit there and meditate and try to figure it out. Is it, Hey, go talk. Maybe the PCA, go talk to other people, get exposed to people who think about it differently. How can someone who thinks they might be trapped in this kind of mentality, how can they break through to the other side? Uh, I mean, so I had to do it the hard way. That's why I was excited to do this podcast. And that's why I picked this topic is like, I learned all this the hard way. I, I had the world beat me over and over and over again until like, I couldn't do anything, but admit I have to change. Mm. Right? I think that like, that was the first, like I had to do that the hard way. I, I delivered the best paint job of all time on a project it was truly not, there wasn't an ounce of this trim that was not freaking cabinet grade and throughout the whole edition. It was freaking flawless. And they didn't call me to bid the second phase of the project. I was like blown <laughs> away. Like truly to this day, it's probably the most thorough paint job I've ever done. I mean, it was wild, but I was there till like 10 o'clock at night, listening to music sanding away all by myself with the client at certain times was a, just a wife at home alone. The husband would be out of town and I, I would be in the other part of her house on the other side of some plastic. And I'd be listening to music and sanding till nine o'clock at night, you know, just crazy shit, super unprofessional. Yeah. And, you know, I, I think I just looking inward about what can I do to change you know, losing the idealism that I had about, well, the paint job should have been enough. You know, I think, yeah, going to the PCA changed so much for me. I mean, it helped me. That's that's when I understood. I, I didn't know a thing about running a painting business until I went to the PCA. And like, all I wanted, my sweet spot was like, let's talk about sandpaper, grits, sprayers, viscosity, how to apply paint, orange peel, all that, I, that that's all I want to talk about. And I, I get to PCA and these guys are like, dude, shut up. No one wants to talk about <laughs> I don't this is care. what we're talking about, right, guys? I remember I met my business partner like the first time. And this and he comes, Gary comes up to me. I'll never forget where he's standing. And, and he starts talking about like, it was gibberish to me at the time. Net profit. I don't remember exactly what he was saying. But he was saying like probably talking about net profit, gross profit, revenue, Cost of all who knows, and I was just like, dude, dude I paint six thousand dollar doors, man, with mirror finishes. You don't even like, I was so clueless. I was so clueless. Yeah. Meanwhile, this guy's freaking absolutely killing it, and I'm broke as a joke. <laughs> like, you know, I think until you are you surround yourself with people who are better than you and are thinking differently, you know. Because the four minute mile, there's a there's thousands of four minute miles that exist in a painting business, and and when you know that someone else has run it, the, the, I don't, for anyone who doesn't know the story of the four minute mile, the guy ran. No one thought it was humanly possible. The guy did it, and like within six months, like thirty more people in the world had done it, and it was just like the power of the human brain knowing that it's possible. You know, all of a sudden you can go do it, and. So I think it's definitely like getting out of being, I'm so happy saying, I don't know. And like, I fucked up my bad, like get really good at that. Like yeah. I'm pretty good at some stuff and I know, I know some stuff. I'm an expert in a few things, but I'm also really comfortable telling you, I don't have a fucking clue or I don't know, or I fucked up. And like, I don't have any ego wrapped around that. Like I'm a human. And, and people appreciate company, that. Yeah. Yeah. And the only way I'll get to the next level is if I admit where I really am, like see yourself honest. I think true self-awareness is, is hard to come by, but when you have it, you can like, you can play the game. It's just like we were talking about. If you don't do job costing, you don't know the world you're playing in. You're playing in a fake world and you're making decisions. And you don't even know what the outcomes are because you're not looking at them. Like if you don't have real data, what like you're just playing a made up world. Don't do your own thing, man. Yeah. And and yeah, great. Now this is this is when we start to point at everybody else. See? All of you, this is this person and this and this is no no no. It 
all of my success in life is any of it has all come from looking inward and I change and I adapt. Yep. Not trying to hope the world's going to change for you. Good luck. Yeah, man, this is, uh, this is deep, man. I appreciate you going so deep. I'm excited for the, for going into serving the high-end clientele. I think that's going to be really awesome. And then your social media marketing greatness. But as we wrap up this first series, going into mistakes, you know, how you, how you've learned from them, overcome them, adapted. Is there anything else you want to add before we wrap it up? Uh, I, I barely got into the mistakes. <laughs> we talked about the high level of stuff. I think that's important, but um, I think, it, I think really the, the takeaway it, for me, what I wish I knew sooner was like, surround yourself with great people. Um, don't be afraid to fail and it, just be real. It, any amount of, of, in authentic in authenticity i guess that's the word any lack of authenticity or or like not being real or not playing with real data it's it might get you through a moment but it, it will never be good like the more you can just be real and then go from there the better but like faking and, and pretending like it, unless you are very aware of it and you know that I'm just faking this for this minute and I'm going to go change this tomorrow. Like it, it can get dangerous to not see yourself for like the truth and be vulnerable. And like the, who cares if you make mistakes, just don't stop, stop making, I wish I could tell myself, stop making the same mistake 10 times before you finally change. Yeah. It's not the world's fault. Nothing is the world's fault. I don't care what's happened to you, how bad of whatever the world did to you. Even if it is the world's fault, thinking of it as the world's fault is always good. Victim mentality is never the answer, even if you're a victim, right? There's plenty of studies that show that's just not the way. Even if you're a victim, don't ever see yourself as a victim. Well, the same thing in business. Like, even if the world and you really did have an asshole client, like I, I, I had a bad client. Uh, yeah, I've, I've had hundreds of them, many, but like last year we wrote off a hundred thousand dollars worth of bad debt, people who didn't pass. And it's so easy to look at a person and go, this person didn't do the right thing and they broke the law or whatever. Right. That is great, but it's not useful. I can't learn a thing by pointing the finger at someone who broke the law or lied to me and then didn't pay me. But what I can do is I can look inward and go, all right, what could I have done? Desperate. If we're talking about this. What, what could I have done to prevent this? Well, at, at the first thing was like, were there red flags in the sales process that I ignored? Yeah. Oops. Like I have control over things. And then I, I don't have control over a bunch of things. It's a serenity. Yeah. Prayer. Understanding that I have control over me. And next time, what could I do next time to prevent this horrible thing that happened to me that was didn't feel like it was my fault, but what could I do to prevent it? All right, well, next time I could listen to red flags. You know, very rarely do, do horrible things or bad things happen to us that we don't have some way of learning from. That's not pointing the finger at the person who did wrong to us. That's not helpful. Yeah. Uh, but it's hard to do. It, it might not be your your fault entirely, but it is your responsibility to try to learn from it and correct it yeah. moving forward. You're only in control of you. So stop pointing the finger, stop talking about other people and start looking in. I, I wish I knew that sooner. I love it. Zach, thank you, brother. I'm excited to talk about more about the high-end clientele in the next episode. Really appreciate you, man. This was awesome. And uh, thanks for coming on the show, brother. Absolutely. If you want to learn more about the topics we discussed in this podcast and how you can use them to grow your painting business, visit paintermarketingpros.com forward slash podcast for free training, as well as the ability to schedule a personalized strategy session for your painting company. Again, that URL is paintermarketingpros.com forward slash podcast. Hey there, painting company owners. If you enjoyed today's episode, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. Give us your feedback. Let us know how we did. And also, if you're interested in taking your painting business to the next level, make sure you visit the Painter Marketing Pros website at paintermarketingpros.com to learn more about our services. You can also reach out to me directly by emailing me at brandon at paintermarketingpros.com and I can give you personalized advice on growing your painting business. Until next time, keep growing.